Before I start studying a new field, I kind of like to go back and take a look at the history of that area uh, and look at what were the major discoveries that led to the current state of knowledge in that field. And that's what I'm going to do here briefly uh, for the polymers area. And one thing I want to emphasize is how transformational uh, the discovery of synthetic polymers was uh, to, um, to human progress. Uh, because if you think about it, before that time, the main materials that were available to build things were things like wood, stone, metal, uh, glass, and ceramics, uh, and that was pretty much it. Uh, so your ability to make parts that were very intricately shaped uh, was limited to operations like carving. Uh, it wasn't really possible to mold things very easily. You could do it with metals uh, to some extent, uh, but being able to make uh, molded parts, uh, films, thin films, things like that, that we uh, think of today uh, with, uh, with plastics uh, and polymers, uh, was something that was not really possible uh, until the 20th century. So the way I kind of think about it is polymers were really the iPhone or the smartphone of the 20th century. Uh, this was a discovery that once it came into the marketplace, uh, it just transformed everything. So that 10, 20 years later, uh, it's hard to imagine what life was like uh, before these kind of products. And just like we have companies like Apple and Google today that we associate with those kind of innovations, uh, companies uh, that were uh, uh, associated with the chemistry and uh, the engineering of these materials like DuPont in particular, those were really the Apples and the Googles of the 20th century uh, in terms of these discoveries. But Polymers, uh, as we said, uh, in terms of natural polymers, at least, uh, those have always existed, and people have been using those for, cent for centuries uh, uh, and for thousands of years. Uh, form, uh, fibers like wood, cotton, uh, silk, uh, those have all been used uh, to make uh, fabrics and materials. Uh, and, and even natural rubber, uh, which comes from the sap uh, of the rubber tree, was also, has also been used uh, for many years. Uh, there's records of the ancient Mayans uh, using uh, these uh, rubbery materials uh, to make toys. Uh, and more recently, uh, materials like uh, shellac, which is a secretion from a type of insect, a beetle, I think, were noticed uh, that uh, they had some properties that were useful in terms of uh, insulating or waterproofing. So coatings uh, based on these kind of materials uh, came into use. But it wasn't until the 1800s that there was a driving force to really uh, use these materials and understand uh, how they could be perhaps produced uh, more efficiently. Uh, and that's because uh, natural rubber in particular began to see significant use. Uh, and this came with industrialization, um, you know, the need for tires, pneumatic tires uh, in particular, but many other things uh, that use these properties of rubber. And rubber, natural rubber, is not what we think of today, like a you know, rubber ball that has a kind of a rigid structure. Uh, this material was kind of a, a gooey uh, thing like silly putty, uh, actually, or chewing gum. Uh, and so there was an, a desire to try to improve those properties uh, to make them more useful. Uh, and Charles Goodyear in the early 1840s uh, was a self-taught chemist that found a way to create basically the structure of rubber that we think of today that is more rigid and bouncy, uh, like a rubber ball. And this was a process uh, he discovered that he called vulcanization. Uh, so he found that if you take natural rubber and add sulfur and heat it up, then it transforms into a, from a gooey kind of consistency to a more uh, rigid consistency. And what was really happening was a process called cross-linking, which we'll talk about later. But basically, these individual polymer chains were being uh, uh, attached uh, together with these cross-links to form a mesh-like network. Uh, and so this uh, gives it more of a, a rigid uh, property to the material. Other advancements were made also in the 1800s in terms of fundamental chemistry that were important to understand. Uh, polymers and how polymers worked. Uh, in Europe, uh, August Kekul uh, was a chemist that uh, deduced the structure of the benzene ring. Uh, and this was important because these kinds of chemical structures uh, play a role in how polymers behave, and we'll see that soon uh, 
uh, when we look at individual uh, polymers and, and connect their structural uh, properties at the molecular level to their bulk properties. Uh, and so along with these developments, uh, people began to understand what was the structure of some of these uh, materials, particularly natural rubber, again, because that was a particularly interesting uh, and important material. This was then understood in terms of these isoprene monomers that when they emerge in the tree sap form are in colloidal suspension, or in other words, droplets. Uh, and when this sap is exposed to air, these droplets coagulate. Uh, and produce the macromolecules that uh, have the properties of, of natural rubber. In 1907, uh, there was a significant advancement by a chemist named Leo Bakeland. Uh, and Leo Bakeland was credited with producing the first completely synthetic or man-made uh, polymer. Uh, and this was a material that he called Bakelite. Uh, so Leo Bakelin found that uh, if he mixed phenol and formaldehyde at a certain ratio at high temperature and pressure, uh, those uh, chemicals would polymerize to form uh, a rigid, uh, hard, uh, and moldable product. And uh, so, what was again, what was happening was similar to vulcanization. Uh, this was uh, initiating a polymerization reaction and a cross-linking reaction uh, that created a material that was uh, rigid but lightweight. Uh, and could be shaped in, in many ways. So this material found a lot of applications in things like kitchenware, uh, combs, jewelry. Uh, it had an interesting appearance, kind of this brown tortoise shell uh, appearance uh, that uh, was kind of appealing. Uh, and so again, these were driven by limitations of conventional materials. Before that time, I mean, it's hard to imagine that combs uh, or jewelry, these kinds of things were made either from metals or from things like ivory. Uh, and those are obviously limited resources. Even at that time, uh, there was uh, concern about the sustainability of being able to produce those things. So these kinds of uh, uh, limitations actually drove these discoveries. Another one uh, actually was billiard balls uh, used in pool tables. It's hard to imagine that you know before this time, ivory was actually the primary material uh, that was used to produce them. And obviously that's a resource that's in limited supply. Uh, and it's not really sustainable. So there was a lot of interest to come up with alternatives uh, to these materials. And Bakelite was an example of the first commercial success uh, of an effort to do that. 